Hello, everybody. Welcome to this session, AgeWell EPIC Conference 2023. My name is Claudine Auger, and I'll be chairing this session. So we're really excited to see you here today. Um, I've been an AgeWell uh, researcher uh, in network investigator since 2015. So I've seen lots of great projects uh, done through AgeWell, and today you will hear really exciting work. So I'm an associate professor at Université de Montréal and scientific director of CREER, the Center for Interdisciplinary Research in Rehabilitation of Greater Montreal. So you can imagine that in my field of rehabilitation, mobility is very important. And the session today will be showing examples of how we can increase mobility of older adults and looking at mobility in a larger scope, including transportation, as this is also very important to maintain uh, our uh, participation in different activities and roles as, as we age. So we're exciting to, excited to have three EPIC presentations today, and we will have speakers Maureen O'Brien and Dr. Matt Christensen, Renaheb Darafshi, as well as Meg Schwellness and Dr. Andrew Frank. So before we uh, end, uh, we start listening to these three presentations, we would like to remind you that the challenge area presentations will take place on Zoom this week every day from 1 to 2.30. And uh, this will be closing on June 2nd, on next Friday. We encourage you to check out AgeWell Epic Conference web page for additional details and registration information. Uh, so th today in the presentation, there will be three 10-minute presentations, and each presentation will be followed by a five-minute Q&A. And the Q&A, uh, you could use this section to ask questions. You can also um, vote on a question that you would like to be addressed at the end, and uh, you can also leave a comment in the Q&A. Um, Following the three presentations and the three uh, five-minute Q&A, there will be a, another session of Q&A with all the three uh, following the three presentations. So more time for more questions and discussions regarding the impact of this research through the AgeWell network. So uh, the session will be recorded and will be available for playback. And so these links to playback will be posted on the EPIC conference webpage and the AgeWell YouTube channel. So now it's time for me to present the two presenters who have a little bio for, for them. So I have first, I would like to introduce Maureen O'Brien. So Maureen O'Brien is pursuing a Master of Science in the medical, in medical Science program at the University of Calgary under the supervision of Dr. Renita Manuka and Dr. Cheryl Barnaby. Maureen recently completed a Bachelor's of Arts and Science in Health at St. Francis Xavier University. She is interested in promoting active aging and maintaining independent ambulation. Her research will examine the feasibility of a new app that teaches people how to use walking aids, and it's called Improving Canadians' Walking Aid Skills, Learning and Knowledge. So the short name for it is I Can Walk. The results of this research will help many older adults who use canes, crutches, and walkers. She will be accompanied by Dr. Matt Christensen, who became involved in the I Can Walk project first as a participant and then as a patient partner. So Matt was diagnosed with type one diabetes in 1981. He's living a very physically active life since 2008 with the first onset of peripheral neuropathy that altered his physical abilities. By 2019, his severity required mobility aids. And by 2023, he retired from a 21 year career as a high school teacher and principal. His interest in the I Can Walk app is to improve his use of mobility aids and to proactively prevent issues and injuries from improper use of these aids. So it uh, will be really uh, great to listen, listening to you, Maureen and Matt, so uh, you can start sharing your presentation. 
perfect. So thank you for that great introduction. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yep, you're good. Perfect. Thank you for that introduction. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone joining us today. And thank you for being here. Today, Matt and I will be discussing my research on evaluating a novel app-based walking aid skills training program called I Can Walk. So every year, millions of Canadians rely on the use of walking aids such as canes, crutches, and walkers for a variety of different reasons, including neurological conditions, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, joint sprains, and so on. Walking aids can have a lot of benefits, such as taking the weight off a certain injured leg, improving overall balance, and improving independence. But people who use walking aids are at an increased risk of walking aid-associated pain or injury. Examples of this include pain in the wrist, elbow, and shoulder from that extra strain on the upper body. People also present with pain in their weight-bearing leg. So for those who are only putting weight on a certain non-injured leg are exposing it to a lot of additional force, which can cause knee or ankle injury. Lastly, there's also an increased risk for falling for reasons such as tripping over their walking aid or being destabilized, which of course can lead to more compounding injuries such as fractures, laceration, and brain injury. So what can we do to prevent this? Well, first we needed to find out what was behind all of this associated pain and injury. What are the common themes? Which highlighted two key problems. First, that many people don't know how to properly fit their walking aids. And second, many people weren't taught how to properly use them which means that this compounding pain and injury may be preventable if we address these two gaps in walking aid fitting and walking aid gait training. Now, Matt here was fortunate enough to receive training on the use of his forearm crutches when he started using them, but then later became unsure if he was maintaining proper form. I'll let him go ahead and share his experience with you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much, Maureen. Um, and was mentioned in the introduction, I am 65 years old. I have retired from a decades long career as a high school teacher and uh, principal. I used to be a very active runner, rugby player and volleyball player. Um, but with the onset of uh, neuropathy in 2008 through to 2019, um, I had to begin to rely upon the use of forearm crutches. When I um, began using forearm crutches, I was properly fitted uh, at the physiotherapist where I go weekly. Um, and yet uh, the focus on the gait and doing things properly. And as seen in the illustration here on your screen, um, forearm crutches that are used are very often used by um, single leg amputees. Um, and I am a person who wears, as Maureen has put up, an AFO or an ankle foot orthosis uh, on each of my legs. Um, so the severe uh, bilateral peripheral neuropathy I had, um, I began first by using a cane, which uh, changed my gait significantly and caused me some uh, severe pain in my hips uh, because I was not using it correctly and it probably was not fitted correctly. Uh, but once I was prescribed uh, forearm crutches and AFOs, um, then I had them fitted properly, which makes a great deal of, um, of difference. Uh, the weekly focus that I have in my physiotherapy, uh, where I've just returned from uh, this afternoon or this morning in, in uh, Calgary time, um, the focus is on my gait and on the proper use of the walking aids so that I can maximize uh, the ability that is there and to avoid injuries, uh, as Maureen has talked about. Perfect. Yeah. So currently, there's no validated program for teaching users about how to properly use their walking aid. So essentially, that's what we created. Our research team has developed a bilingual, low cost smartphone application for patient use. That is called Improving Canadians Walking Aid Learning Skills and Knowledge, or I Can Walk. And it includes several modules for various types of walking aids that teach patients how to fit and walk with their walking aid. I'll let Matt go ahead and explain how it works using a video of him actually completing a module. Okay. Um, so after choosing the walking aid that you use, and as you can see, there are six of them listed on the side, um, you are led to a screen um, that 
allows you to take a look at the skills to try out and to work on. And so I was taken to this screen about the proper use and the best practice for using of forearm crutches. Um, and this is was not something that I had ever seen before, but it was extremely helpful. And as you can see, um, there are a number of views of the person using the forearm crutches so that you can see them from the front and from the side, um, which is also uh, beneficial. Then there are a list of components um, and a skill that you can choose uh, to take a look at it. And we can see images of me uh, taking a look at do I have the proper foot placement, are the tips of the forearm crutches in the appropriate places relative to my smallest toe and the front of my foot? Um, do I have my uh, hands in the proper place, et cetera? So you can go through and take a look at this um, and you can look at each one of these components as you are using your walking aid. So you are able to take a look at what happens. The videotaping of my use of forearm crutches was then led me to taking a look at the comparison of my best practice to, sorry, the best practices to what I am doing. There are, you're guided through a series of skill performance questions. Uh, and these questions include uh, three responses, three possible responses, yes, not yet, or partially. And as you can see on here, my assessments hit all three of those. Um, and the language is, is extremely inclusive, so it is confirmatory when you have a yes. Uh, when you are doing it partially, there is an opportunity to improve. And the use of the term not yet, as opposed to can't, won't, or doesn't, um, and from my experience as a disabled person, uh, there are a lot of no's and negatives that come with it. So this one is inclusive and is helpful for us to see how you can improve and how you can maintain the things uh, that you are doing well. So you can review the components, uh, not only here, you can have a score at the bottom, uh, which is helpful for people who uh, like the numerical feedback as well. And then this is also something that you can return to and look at to make sure that the things that you are doing well, um, that you are doing them yes, that you continue to do them and where you are moving from not yet into partially or not yet into yes. Yeah, exactly. So our hope is that by using this app to teach patients how to appropriately fit and walk with their walking aids, we'll be able to reduce the risk of those related injuries. Which leads me to our current study. So our objective is to assess the satisfaction and usability of the I Can Walk app by walking aid users. To do this, we are using a single arm pre post pilot study design. At baseline, participants will come in to complete a pre-survey, and after they complete their first session with the I Can Walk app with the help of the research assistant, where they will go through a fitting module and a gait training module specifically pertaining to their device. Two weeks later, participants will come back in to complete another session with the app, repeating those same modules, and then afterwards completing a post-survey, responding to open-ended comment questions surrounding satisfaction and usability of the app. So far, results have been obtained from five participants. Um, average age is around 58. Four of these participants have been male. Uh, two of these participants used canes, one used auxiliary crutches, one used forearm crutches, and one used a four-wheeled walker. This slide include participants' responses to one of our questions regarding satisfaction with the app. But instead of me telling you why participants liked our app, I will let you hear directly from Matt and he'll explain his experience with the app. Uh, thank you, Maureen. There are five points uh, that I would like to raise. The very first one is to see the proper use of your own walking aid um, is tremendously supportive of being able to maximize the technology and increase and, and best support your mobility. And this also has two small components. One is what is the best practice for a much larger group of people? That is the people who use the same walk, walking or mobility aid that you use. And then the other part of it is the personalized uh, aspect 
of what happens to it. So how am I doing? So the second thing is about having the proper fitting, um, as well as the third one, which is the injury prevention through the proper use, because that is one of the things that uh, is of great concern when you use a mobility device, which is I want to make sure that I am upright, that I do not fall and that I do not um, injure myself in a different way and another part of my body. Uh, the fourth part is the feedback. What am I doing well and what do I need to work on, which is helpful and it can be done in a recursive manner. You can look at it every week or every two weeks. Uh, you can discuss that information and that's the fifth point with your caregivers taking a look at what is there. Um, you can also do this with your family and as someone who has had uh, a large number of medical appointments across my life, um, there's an awful lot of information that comes and I don't always know that I've captured it. Um, so in particular, looking at the components here, being able to see each one of the skills or the tasks that are involved in it is really, really informative and helpful. And that's also information that you can share with your caregivers, as well as your family members who always have a lot of interest in helping you to do well. Perfect. So just to reiterate the significance of the current study, currently there is a problem with pain and injury risk associated with the use of walking aids, which may be prevented through adequate training and on fitting and gait training with walking aids, which is why we developed the I Can Walk app. Our preliminary results have shown very positive feedback towards our app, showing high satisfaction and usability of it. In the future, we hope to have additional users try out our app in order to continue to improve its content and functionality with the overarching goal of making this app more accessible to walking aid users across Canada. Just like to say, take a second to thank and acknowledge my supervisors, collaborators, lab members, and of course, Matt for their continued support and help in this project. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Great, great presentation, Maureen and Matt. Uh, it was uh, very interesting and we see questions. Um, so I see three questions at least, and I want to pay the attention, bring the attention of people. There was a link in the discussion in the chat uh, section that you may want to click to see uh, the app. So we have a question by Brian, who is asking who is grading and scoring the I Can Walk videos how time consuming is it? Great question. So um, it is a self-assessment. So the user who is using the app is scoring themselves on a yes, partial, not yet. Um, it could also be used with a caregiver and you could kind of collaborate to make those decisions, but it is mainly a self-assessment. How time consuming is it? Um, I guess it depends on how long you want to kind of look at the video and know what you're doing and what you're not doing. Our um, app sessions we do in our data collection normally take a little bit less than 15 minutes, which includes the fitting module and the gate training module and taking those videos of the participants. So if that gives you a little bit of an idea. Um, yeah, I yeah. think this answers very well. Um, so someone, uh, Farah is asking, so this app is like a user guide for people using uh, walking uh, aids, right? So she wants to understand. So I guess this is what you just explained. Yeah, yeah. It's an interactive yes. platform that we it aims to teach people how to fit or walk with their walking aids. Um, yeah, a user guide, I think is a good way to describe it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and actually, Deb uh, says that it's very uh, it's great because many seniors have been prescribed a walker but end up using it poorly. Uh, so this coaching is really useful. So she was just reinforcing the uh, the utility of this uh, of your project. And mm -hmm. I see a general question: on How Matt became a partner in the research? And I'm wondering if we could keep that for the last part at the end um, to, to see if we can have a general discussion about that. Um, so if you agree that I would keep this question um, as a general discussion at the end, if you agree, both of you. So you can have time to think, Matt, on, the, <laughs> on this response. Yeah, and, that, that um, sounds too. Right? And I see a question about the content. Is the usability of the app um, 
the UI and the UX, are they tested separately and has it been validated already? Yeah, so we are doing a few other things in this study as well that unfortunately due to time constraints, I wasn't able to include everything. Um, the content, if by content you mean the app content scoring, we are um, kind of looking for relationships between them too. So we have the walking aid fitting skill and the walking aid gait skill. Um, separately, we are assessing those if there are changes from our baseline to our follow-up session. Um, so that's, I if think that answers your question. Yeah, well, maybe the person who has that question could come back at the end if they think yeah, we should go further. So that, so we thank you very much and we will come back to you later on. So we would now move to the second presentation um, by Renahi Darashi. So while, while Rihanna he gets uh, uh, ready, I will just uh, read her bio. So uh, she's a biomedical engineering master student who's uh, specializing in wearable technology at the University of Calgary. So it's also morning for her right now. Um, she's working at the Healthy City Lab as a research assistant. Prior to joining the Healthy Sitting Lab, Rihanna had, had graduated from the University of Tehran with a bachelor's in computer science. Her research is about the development of algorithmic tools to characterize and evaluate important navigational and maneuvering driving behaviors for older adults based on everyday naturalistic driving data. So, Renahi, I'll let you share your screen and we are ready to listen to your presentation. I will confirm once I hear you well that I hear you. For now, I don't hear you. Um, can you hear me? Now I do, yes. Okay, hi everyone. Um, Thank you for the great presentation, uh, for the great introduction. Um, I'm Ray, and um, and uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, the project that I've been working on. It's called uh, Navigational Decision Making in Older Adults with Cognitive Impairment and Analysis of uh, Real World Driving Patterns. So first, uh, let's talk about some uh, backgrounds. As we all know, uh, driving is the most common form of mobility among older adults. And uh, with the number of people aged 80 and above predicted to triple between uh, 2020 and uh, 2050, um, we can expect a significant increase in the number of older drivers on the roads. However, uh, the implications of older adults stopping driving to, due to uh, cognitive or physical decline uh, cannot be ignored. Um, when individuals lose the ability to drive, it often leads to a cascade of health issues, including depression or even uh, an accelerated disease progression. So it is uh, important to note that despite being recognized as some of the safest drivers on the road, older adults uh, still face the highest uh, fatal crash rates. And uh, this is a uh, concerning statistics that demands our attention. Um, in the light of these facts, it is uh, crucial that we address the challenges faced by older drivers. We must work toward uh, developing strategies and uh, support systems that ensure the safety, well being, and um, continued independence of this vital segment of our population. So let's talk about uh, the data that we used for this project. We collected the data of 276 uh, older adults. We, uh, sorry, we, uh, uh, we installed GPS devices in their vehicles. These GPS devices, um, collect data every 30 seconds, and we did that for the period of two years. These devices collect longitude and latitude, timestamps, and um, 
some GPS messages, including if the trip has started and also ended, and also some minor or major uh, impacts detected by the accelerometer, such as heart breakings or sudden acceleration. Uh, all of our participants are located in San, San Luis, uh, US. So let's uh, go back to the uh, research question. And what is navigational decision making? We had this hypothesis that there is a relationship between the frequency of driving on specific routes or to a particular destination and uh, incidents of driving errors and driving behaviors. So in this uh, project, we are focusing on destinations and the repeatability of destinations, distinct paths for each particular destinations and uh, road complexity. So at first, uh, we try to solve this problem by finding the most common path for each participant. We, uh, uh, the method that we used was the first clustering trips based on destination and start points. And for each of these cluster, we tried to uh, cluster uh, each trip uh, on that group based on the similarity of the routes. The challenges that we had the first one was short trips with no movements. These trips were recognized as the most uh, common trips when uh, we tried our uh, algorithm at first. And the second one was cycle trips that has the same start points and um, destination. The, these trips um, have the same, uh, these trips doesn't uh, have the same start point and destination, but doesn't mean that the route that is taken um, is similar at all. And for example, as you can see uh, in the right side, this is one of the, this is the uh, most common trip of one of our first participants. In the next step, we try to visualize the, all of the data for each of our participants in uh, three clusters, the new destinations, most common route and most common destination. The point of vi this visualization was to first not lose uh, data due to generalizing. We wanted to see all of the outliers. And the second was that we wanted to see the density of data in each of the clusters. And we also wanted to see the patterns of habit changing. So as you can see, um, there is a timeline of participation and each point represents a trip and the color of each point represents the, how risky that trip was. So, uh, so for example, as you can see at the end, uh, about at the end uh, period of the first common destination, that participant took this destination less often, but they still took their uh, most common route for that destination. And also you can see more colored points in the new destination, which means that this participant uh, had more risky behaviors when they tried new destinations. In the next step, based on our uh, observations, we computed some measures. Uh, the first one is the total number of trips after uh, pre-processing and filtering the data. The second one is the distinct number of destinations for each of our participants in the participation period. The second, the next one is short trips, trips with uh, length less than uh, two minutes, cycle trips that has the same start point and destination, new destinations, the destinations that um, observed only once in our data set. We don't know if they took that like before or after our data collection. Uh, the most common destination, the most common route, and distinct paths for the most common destination. And uh, also uh, trips with heartbreaks, sudden acceleration, and overspeeding more than a threshold in each cluster are um, labeled as risky trips. Based, off, uh, based on our uh, computed measures, we um, uh, computed some p-values and some uh, violin plots. 
uh, as you can see, uh, there were significant differences in some of the measures between uh, our two groups, people with CDR equal to zero and people with CDR greater than zero. So uh, we saw a significant difference in number of uh, cycle trips and new destinations, meaning that people with CDR equal to zero took a significantly uh, uh, more number of cycle trips and new destinations. We didn't uh, we couldn't observe any significant difference in the number of most common destinations and most common routes. Also, in terms of uh, portion of risky trips, we didn't see any significant difference between two groups. But uh, the, the most significant difference that we saw was in the number of uh, routes taken to the most common destination, meaning that people with CDR greater than zero took significantly less number of uh, routes and tried less variety of routes when they took their first common destination, for example, when they're going to work. And uh, the result, we can conclude from the results that people with uh, people that had uh, CDR greater than zero um, showed a more conservative navigational uh, choices. They took less number of cycle trips, less number of new destinations, and tried less a variety of routes for their most common destination. And at the end, let's talk about some limitations of using natural distinct driving data. The first one is varied drivers. We didn't have any identification method of who is using the vehicle, so we might have collected uh, data of multiple drivers uh, and uh, for uh, one person. And uh, we collected all of our data in St. Louis, US. The data collected from specific area may not be applicable uh, or representative of driving behaviors in other location. We uh, observed some uh, missing data in large time periods. And uh, we think that uh, it's caused by the maintenance of the device or the vehicle. And also the last one that I think is the most important one is that driving behaviors are influenced by external factors such as time of the day that the driving is occurred or the volume of traffic, weather conditions, or construction activities. The possible future impacts that we hope this project have the first one is uh, the development of prediction tools for preventing driving errors based on the road that the person is taking right now, at that moment. The second one can be uh, personalized driving aids and interventions based on each particular person's driving data. And the third one is evidence-based guidelines for evaluating driving ability. And uh, I think that's all. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you very much, Ray. It was really interesting. And this is a huge master project that you're uh, doing right now. I saw some, one question, but you answered. Uh, but the person, Brian, was wondering how the routes were rated. Uh, so what was a dangerous route? He said you answered it, but uh, I don't know if you want to add anything re regarding that question. Uh, sure. So um, we, uh, our device collected some uh, or uh, GPS messages based on the acceleration. So if, for example, there was a heartbreak or a sudden acceleration or, or, or I didn't mention that, but there was like also over speeding. And we collected this based, uh, based on the accelerometer and also the speed. But this is very preliminary. So we, uh, we are working on um, extracting some more advanced measures such as lane maintenance or stopping at the stop signs in the future. So if I understand well, it's not some routes that are already coded as being dangerous or not. It's mostly no, the driving, the way yeah, the driving. person is driving. So uh, thank you. I think it was worth asking the question even if... Uh, 
Brian felt you had answered it. There's also Saye who is asking, what are the advantages of using naturalistic driving methods compared to other methods like a simulated driving experiment on on-road tests? Um, yeah, sure. So on the naturalistic driving method, we uh, get to see more uh, live-like experience. And also uh, we have, uh, we can uh, do that experiment for a larger period of time. So we can see like habits or like uh, daily routines that people take. We can like um, study if, for example, a person uh, drives at night or drives uh, in only in the morning, or we can also look at their like destinations and, um, and like every life thing that, can affect their driving. Thank you very much. Um, Farah is asking if you have worked in collaboration with some kind of vehicles to see the applicability of the solutions you would like to develop. Um, so I guess some kind of vehicles. So I'm wondering if she means other types of vehicles in her question. Um, um, that's, yeah. that's the way I understand the question. Yeah, we, we haven't done that yet, but uh, yeah, we're hoping after like uh, we have uh, more advanced results on this. Yeah, we would love to do that. Thank you. So I'm looking at the other. Um, OK, so I have a, a question. Uh, do you have data on how driving challenges differ across provinces? I, you're talking about U.S. data right now, yeah. right? Uh, do you have any access to Canadian data and see how this um, could affect you know, the future yeah. development? Yeah, we actually uh, right now we are also working on another data set collected in Hamilton, Ontario. And that one is a richer data set. Uh, we have like much more records and uh, we also have videos and we're working on like uh, also processing that data and um, and comparing to the one that we have in US. But right now our work, uh, this project is only focused on that one, on the uh, US data. Yes, and it's already a lot, I guess, for a master's student project. Uh, so thank you so much, right? You really answered very well these questions. And I think, uh, well, we can uh, then wait at the last, you know, the last period, there's a block of uh, questions. So if there are more questions, you will be able to answer them at that time. So thank you. Thank you very much. So now we will uh, start presenting the last uh, group who will be presenting. So it's, uh, there are two people. So Meg Schwellness, uh, who is a research assistant with Dr. Nuffel at the Briere Research Institute, working on gathering control data with the Virage driving simulator. So again, uh, another presentation related to driving. She has background in human-centered design and biology and recently completed a master of biomedical engineering. And she will be presenting with Dr. Andrew Frank. He's a cognitive behavioral neurologist and researcher at Briere Memory Program at the Elizabeth Briere Hospital in Ottawa, Ontario. Dr. Frank's clinical practice is focused on the diagnosis and treatment of neurodegenerative diseases, such as dementia due to Alzheimer's disease. His clinical interest lies in the early detection of cognitive disorders, such as mild cognitive impairment. Dr. Frank's research interest centers on investigating new pharmacological treatments and technologies for Alzheimer's disease. So Meg and Andrew, uh, I invite you to share your screen. I'll let you know if I hear you well and then... Uh... Can you hear me now? Yes, I do. All right, perfect. All right. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Claudine, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Good afternoon and good morning to everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking with Dr. Frank about reducing simulator adaptation syndrome with the Virage VS500M-R driving simulator. Um, so as was possibly sort of touched on, but I'll explain a little more as to why we're talking about a driving simulator in this age well program is that uh, we're currently looking at how to improve the uh, 
evaluation of older adult drivers who are becoming at risk drivers. So uh, typically due to cognitive impairment or another medical condition, um, sort of relating back to you know, the last presentation. <laughs> So the current types of driving evaluations are the on-road driving test, which is the gold standard, or a cognitive test proxy, which is administered typically by the driver's physician. There are some issues though with these two types of driving evaluations. Uh, with the on-road test, it is potentially dangerous as you are putting a at-risk, potentially bad driver on the road. And even though the cars that they do the evaluations in have two brake pedals, one for the instructor, um, you know, it's still potentially a dangerous situation. Um, and also they're very expensive, typically costing between $700 and $800 out of pocket uh, money for the patient. And especially that's very costly if you still fail. Uh, the cognitive test proxy issues, um, it's not a directly relevant link. So there's been some studies that show that there is a link between the cognitive test proxy and the driving uh, risk of the adult. However, it's not directly like a one-to-one -one ratio and it can sometimes be a little off. Uh, so it's not a like full predictor of it. And also patients and families don't really see the link of a paper test to driving risk and evaluation of driving behavior. So we need a new method of testing that is relevant, directly relevant, like evaluating driving behaviors that is safe and that is lower cost. Um, and so I'm gonna now invite Dr. Frank to sort of speak more about this, this problem and, and his experience. Thank you so much, Meg. Uh, an excellent introduction and the presentations today have been wonderful. Uh, yes, driving is an extremely emotional topic. Um, it, it strikes at someone's uh, identity and independence. And um, if someone in the office is deemed unsafe or requiring investigation, uh, it can lead to a significant uh, defensive um, response, uh, possibly even conflict between a patient and physician in uh, in, in trying to deal with an issue, which in many jurisdictions, uh, there are legal requirements to do so for the safety of individuals, but also the safety of the public. As Meg mentioned, we have cognitive test proxies, which are like paper and pencil tests, which we do in the office, for example, drawing a clock or the trail making test part A and B, uh, linking letters and numbers alternating in order. And yes, there is some literature showing that there's a link between the performance of these paper and pencil tests to driving safety, but they're not perfect. They're paper and pencil tests. They're not driving tests. Uh, and furthermore, um, if a physician tries to use the, that kind of data to make decisions, patients and their families may not agree that they're linked uh, and may um, and, and may counter uh, with, with uh, statements that this does not seem to make sense. If there's any way to um, diminish the, uh, the conflict, uh, a physician can order an on-road driving assessment, as Meg mentioned. And uh, this is the gold standard. It's an actual car in which an individual can drive with an instructor uh, to determine if someone is safe on the road. However, this too can cause conflict because, as Meg mentioned, it's very expensive. It's also stressful. And so for all of these, in fact, if someone is compelled to take an on-road driving assessment, um, they may, and, and when they learn of the cost, seven or $800, which can be acceptable for some, but prohibitive for others, uh, this entire evaluation system may simply be adding insult to injury, uh, where someone's driving is called into question by a paper test, and then one is compelled to take an on-road test, which is very expensive, and in the end may lead to failure, as Meg mentioned, or uh, unsafe driving, which then leads to suspension of someone's license. This is a challenging area of medicine and very emotional that can fracture the relationship between uh, patients and their healthcare providers. So is there another option? And uh, as Meg is mentioning, there is, uh, you know, this project is, is looking to fill a great clinical need for a less expensive way to assess driving safety in the aging and potentially cognitively impaired population. And they may represent 
a driving simulator. And thank you, Dr. Frank, for uh, that wonderful sort of, you know, lived experience uh, description. So yeah, so we're hoping that driving simulators can at least become a component of this evaluation to help uh, make it a little easier for these older adults. They can be low cost testing, uh, they can produce reproducible results, and it would be a safe testing environment uh, being in a room rather than on the road. However, uh, and this is what we're really talking about today is that the potential issue of using the simulators is that they can cause simulator adaptation syndrome. So uh, this is more commonly also known as simulator sickness or sim sickness. It's very similar to motion sickness, but sort of the opposite in that uh, the physicality is a little different. So, you know, typical motion sickness example is reading in a car. Your book is stationary and you're looking at the stationary book, but your vestibular system knows that your body is moving and this dissonance can cause motion sickness. Sim sickness is kind of the opposite in that uh, your body is stationary, you're not moving, but the visuals on the screens that are around you are, and they're sort of indicating that your body should be moving. And so the thought is that this dissonance can be a cause of this simulator sickness. It's not fully understood, but that's a thought. Some common symptoms uh, include nausea, headache, headfulness, and disorientation and dizziness. Um, and some preventative measures include keeping the, the simulator in a cool room uh, between 67 and 7 degree, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, allowing airflow in the participant, having a higher degree of immersion in the experience, and lower visual flow and loading on the screen. So our study, we started collecting data from normal healthy drivers in March of this year. We collected demographic simulator sickness and driving data. This is our setup, setup right here. Uh, there was a little fan here that could blow air on the participant. Um, we had the seat actually moving to uh, mimic the G-forces on the participant while they're driving. And the sequence of methodology was doing driving adaptation with short breaks to answer the simulator sickness questionnaire, followed by driving reaction time data collection and, and short breaks to answer the simulator sickness questionnaire. But we had a problem is that 67% of our participants for this first version of our protocol could not finish the data collection due to simulator sickness. Uh, so that's bad. So we're like, all right, we gotta change it. We gotta figure out what we can do. So we discussed some issues with the VHH simulation designers. And what we changed was to increase these breaks when they do the simulator sickness questionnaire to at least five minutes. We increased the steering wheel force to provide some tactile feedback for participants. Uh, quite a few of them were overturning a little bit because the steering wheel was too easily turned. And uh, we changed the order of the modules to break up the driving a little more. I mentioned that we did reaction time tests and we kind of put them alternating with the data collection of the driving modules. And so with this V2 protocol, we had the non-completion rate halved to 30%, but we did want to try for better. Uh, and so we tested out various changes on ourselves, the research team, uh, to evaluate the efficacy of these changes. Um, so as you can see in the image, there's some of the changes there, and there's the fan, as I mentioned. Uh, we decreased the steering wheel force slightly. Um, this was, we had apparently gone too much in one way, so we dialed back. We turned off the seat motion, so as I mentioned, it kind of mimic G-forces and we stopped that. And we partially covered the screens to reduce the visual flow. You can see the cardboard here. We also tint the screens to about 50% of the sides. And we increased the indirect lighting in the room just to make it a little less dark when the participant is driving. And so uh, our findings were that for this V3 protocol, the non-completion rate decreased down to 25%, which is unfortunately back up, but it, died, like, it uh, is between 25 and 30% typically. We had an overall better experience for participants. We had fewer complaints about the wheel sensitivity. We had fewer causes of motion sickness. We have participants getting further in the data collection. So those who don't actually complete it, they do still get through the majority of the session rather than stopping almost halfway through. Uh, and the participants who do complete it, their symptoms have been getting milder. So sometimes they can still be symptomatic. And so they get like milder symptoms now. And so our next steps are just to look at how to improve participant experience even further for future studies. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Meg. And Andrew, it was very interesting and, and to see you in the same session as looking at the naturalistic evaluation. So it'll be room for discussion, I guess, in the last uh, time we have. But let's just focus on you for now and the questions we, we had for your presentation. So Catherine is asking, is there any information to suggest that individuals that experience motion sickness may be less or more at risk for SAS? Um, so we can't fully tell. It, it typically is a trend that those who have a tendency towards motion sickness do typically uh, have simulator sickness, but I've had it where participants have a moderate tendency towards motion sickness and they complete it with barely any symptoms at all. And I've had participants who have no inclin uh, inclination towards motion sickness who get very sick very quickly. Um, so unfortunately, it's not a great predictor. Um, so I, it, that's my answer. Yeah, we've tried. We've tried to find the link, and we're still, we're still looking. I, I may have missed it, but you talk about the three protocols. And did you specify the number of participants at each of these three phases? I was not sure that I wasn't clear to me. Yeah, uh, we didn't just because at the time of creating this presentation, those numbers were fluctuating. <laughs> Um, but uh, we had nine participants in the first protocol, so three of them completed and six did not. We had 23 participants in the V2 protocol, of which seven did not complete, and now we have over 28, I believe, uh, who have completed the third protocol, and of those, I believe it's nine uh, who have not completed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you're, you know, there's that also that reference group that as it grows, you may, uh, you may have a, it, you know, having percentages on small ends, it can sometimes make it look inflated. So uh, great. Um, so I'm looking at the Q&R and I don't see a new question. Let me just look at the chat. Um, so people are saying it's very interesting and um, yeah, they had not uh, looked at this. Um, can you share more about where you wanna go with this research and in, uh, in a few minutes? Uh, yeah, so um, we're hoping, and I mean, Dr. Frank can also, uh, I think have an answer to this, but uh, we're hoping that uh, by collecting the normative data, then we can look at how the normative data differs from any patient data with any sort of medical condition or impairment. Um, and we're hoping that there will be enough of a difference that we can then use it as part of the driver evaluation um, to predict if the driver is in fact an at-risk driver, if they are not very good on the road or if they're not going to be very good on the road versus just being more like a normal driver um, and fitting in with that category of data. So if I understand you correctly, uh, there are commercial um, simulators out there. And this one, can you, in a nutshell, tell us what this new simulator adds, just to make sure that we're clear on its uh, the, the advantage of this one relative to the others that are available on the market right now? Dr. Frank, would you like to answer that question? I think you have sure. more knowledge um... that. No, it's an excellent question, and um, Meg is right. Uh, we absolutely would like to take this research further after doing testing those who are normal to start testing those who do have mild cognitive impairment, possibly even mild dementia, uh, to see if there is a clear difference in the results between those who are normal uh, and those who are um, have clinical evidence of cognitive impairment. And uh, Meg is right. Once again, we would be very interested to see if this technology could actually enter into clinical care so that perhaps many individuals may not need to invest seven or eight hundred dollars in an on-road driving test uh, which might be risky and very expensive as Meg mentioned uh, and, and done in a much safer way and less expensive way. Uh, to our knowledge uh, other um, commercial driving simulators um, are not used in clinical care. And in fact, we're not aware of any um, commercial simulators used in Canada. So we would like to uh, grow this potential uh, to hopefully reach many people who would benefit from it. Um, but as Meg described, 
it's critical that we analyze the uh, simulator sickness because this technology can't be used uh, in any population if it's uh, making individuals feel uh, sick uh, or unwell and unable to complete the assessment. Uh, so we still have a ways to go. Mm -hmm, I see. And Claudine, I think to answer your question a little more as well, I'm going to share my screen to show uh, the first image of the slides, uh, just because it shows, you know, this is the simulator in action. Um, and you can see that on the screen, it's very similar to a city environment. And to my knowledge, this simulator is the one that has the most like city accuracy. So it feels the most like you're in a city. The simulation and the immersion in the experience is, I believe, the highest fidelity that we know of so far, or at least one of the highest fidelity simulator. So that is, I think, why we chose this one specifically is because it is such high fidelity. You know, the seat moves to mimic the G-forces. The, the screens are crazy, like right around you. The driver sits in the middle. Um, so I hope that kind of helps answer yes, that question really a little really bit. Yes, really helpful. Thank you. <laughs> like you, you wish that you could resolve that motion sickness so that you have the, well, not the motion, the, the SAS. <laughs> yes. So, um, oh yes, I have another question here. Would it be plausible to set this up throughout driving testing centers with provincial partners? What costs would be associated with this? I could touch on that, yes. Uh, that, that was certainly my hope for the future. Is it some tech, it doesn't have to be this particular um, brand, but a technology like this installed at a, um, ministry testing center uh, and and operated at a low cost this would be a dream because it would improve safety uh, at a much lower cost um, but at the same time i do not know the exact cost to roll that out um, so it was it's basically an aspiration uh, to hopefully allow this technology to enter clinical care one day mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, also, as the technology improves, and while we're still doing studies with it, of course, the technology will change even more. So we can't, it, you know, you can't really predict it even right mm -hmm. now. Well, thank you. This is very uh, clearly answered. And uh, um, if people are ready, we could uh, get into the uh, general session as of, as the all the presenters will be together. So we're on that general theme on mobility and transportation. So how can our research have impact on Canadians? And maybe I would come back to uh, Matt and Maureen about that question on how you became partners. I said we would uh, postpone this question to the general session because establishing partnerships is very important in our type of research if we want to uh, go further than the lab part. So let, I'll, I'll be eager to listen to how you uh, became partners together. Um, my physiatrist is Dr. Renita Manoka, who is Maureen's supervisor. And as often happens when you go and visit medical practitioners, if there are forms of research or opportunities for you, they pass them out. I reply to it, I got information back and that's how we started. And as you can probably tell, I'm quite happy to be involved in this and to talk about my experience. So that's how we became partners. Great. Maureen, anything to add? Yeah, I think it was um, great. Matt reached out and then joined our study as a participant. And then of course, had some great things to say, great, well-spoken feedback. Um, so once I heard out about this conference, I reached back out to Matt and asked if he would help collaborate on this. And he said he'd be more than happy to. So it's it was great. very well done. And this uh, you completed each other very well. There was another question for you, uh, Maureen and Matt. It was uh, uh, quite interesting, again, about partnership. Uh, someone asked if you had been in contact with the Canadian Red Cross because they do lend different types of assistive technology and walking aids, and if it had been explored. I know as a master's student, Maureen, you, you may not be in a position to answer that, but maybe yes. So have you heard of a 
the role of the Canadian Red Cross and have the team considered this uh, partnership? No, I, I'm honestly not familiar with it. Um, we don't currently have a partnership with them, but that would be something definitely interesting to consider. I know part of the research before I came onto this project was based upon how people are actually obtaining their walking aids and it's so many different methods. Um, and that's part of the reason why people aren't taught how to properly fit them or walk them because all kinds of people are prescribing them. Individuals are getting them on their own from the pharmacy, but um, that definitely would be an important collaboration to consider. I think the other part of that question was if we were looking at short-term or long-term yes. users. And the answer to that is both, everyone. We haven't um, narrowed down to a subgroup of users. So we're we're collecting data on duration of use in our eligibility questionnaire when we're doing this to see if it does have an effect on, you know, how long someone's been using their walking aid to see if it makes more or less of a difference. But yeah, that's an important, I wrote it down actually. So <laughs> hopefully they will, they, we will collaborate with them in the future. So thank you for that. Yes. And also do people go back to the app more than once, you know, do they regularly go back to it or the training was so clear to them that they don't go back to it? I guess that could be also part of your questions that you could look at. Uh, no yeah. matter how you used it personally, was it like that 15 minute session that you described, Maureen? Did it pretty much cover your, your needs? Uh, it's It certainly did. Um, the, the thing is, because this is initial research, um, I don't have the app right now, but I I can provide you with the information that I would uh, take a look at the app. I would share that with the physiotherapists that I work with, and then we would continue to use that. I mean, physiotherapists very often uh, videotape uh, patients or clients. Um, and again, that would be one of the things um, that is there. And because I take lots of notes, there are things that I made note of uh, as reminders to me, particularly about uh, placement of the end of the of the forearm crutches for me, because that's the part where I have uh, probably my biggest challenges. And it it's a it would be great to have the app to continue to do to do that as well. The other thing is, if you move from one mobility aid to another, there are going to be some things that you need to learn differently about this particular aid uh, as opposed to another one. So if, as I did move from a cane to forearm crutches, there were some things that I needed to make adaptations to. And it was much, much clearer once I was able to see here's best practice. Um, and then what does that mean for me? Oh, I think I'm doing it. Maybe I am, maybe I'm not. So that, mm -hmm. that was really helpful as well. Thank you. That's very clear. Um, I saw a question from University of Prince Edward saying, uh, do you use the same method to fit walkers? So uh, I'll let you answer that question, Maureen. Um, yeah, so same method. It's the same interactive method style, um, but using a different instructional video on someone showing you how to fit or walk with a walker. And then the components are some of them are the same, like flat soled shoes, keeping your head parallel to the ground, keeping your trunk straight. Some things like that are um, the same, but then some more specific kind of walker related components are different. Yeah. Um, we, we could go back to the chat, or I was wondering if, as a group, when you listen to each other's presentation, if you had questions for the others um, um, in case. Yes, Meg. Uh, actually, I was, I mean, I was the one who actually originally posed, uh, Maureen, to you the question about the content versus UI UX. Um, uh -huh. I have the background in design, so I, you know, <laughs> tried to do as support. Uh, but the question was sort of, uh, have you guys evaluated the content of the app, the information that you guys provide, the videos and whatnot, separately from the UI UX, which is, you know, the visual flow of the app, the visuals on the app, stuff like that. Yeah, so I guess to kind of answer that, our app was developed using um, a few different kind of stakeholders, including uh, physiotherapists, patient knowledge users, physiatrists. Um, but our research right now is towards, there is a section of it that is kind of 
validating the app. And then the usability piece is a separate, a separate objective, kind of a separate study, honestly. Um, but we are, and then we are also using tests, including the two minute walk test, Berg balance scale, um, a timed up and go test to see if there are any changes in general balance and mobility. Um, but yeah, I think we're definitely still in the pilot sort of phases trying to get this app validated. Um, yeah. Thanks. And then just also a follow up question. Uh, you mentioned that the there was a self evaluation component when they look at their gait and their positioning and all that. Um, and I was wondering if because I'm assuming that you sort of helped guide them through the use of the app. Uh, did you help them with that evaluation or did you simply watch them do the evaluation? And was there any discrepancy between what they actually self-evaluated and what you thought would be the actual answer? Yeah, so definitely that is a bit of an issue that can come up because sometimes, you know, we are um, assisting the participant in using the app, but when they are completing that self-evaluation, we're nodding to what they say, but we're not suggesting any kind of form response because the goal is for the participant to be using this app on their own to see, you know, what is their own evaluation of themselves. So we're trying to not um, kind of come in between that. So it is a self-evaluation. And then the other part of that, that's something I didn't mention as well, is we're also doing a walking aid skills test, which is something my PI had developed as a test that we're also trying to get validated, that is more of an obje objective measure of how well someone is using their walking aid. So we're also getting participants to complete that at baseline and follow up. So that's our version of evaluating um, how well they're using their walking aid. So that's another component to the research as well. Well, that's and very, so, well, yeah, oh, sorry, you're- yeah, I was, no, no, I was just so like, how do those two compare? Like the, your evaluation of their walking versus their own evaluation? Have, their, have they been similar? Have the patients kind of been more optimistic? Um, I haven't really looked at them directly related to each other, honestly, yet. Um, we're still in the very preliminary phases, but it will be interesting to see if they are similar or very different. I see that Dr. Frank has his, has raised his hand. So another question. Yes, it's for Ray on uh, naturalistic driving. Is it logged if someone is using their own personal GPS um, navigation device like Garmin or the Google Maps or Waze? And does that affect the data? Um, yes, sure. That's uh, also one of our uh, limitations and like what we're uh, thinking about it and considering it that uh, the method of navigation that people choose. So um, some people might just navigate based on their um, own knowledge and some might uh, use like Google and uh, we don't have like any data of the method that we use. So that's like one of the limitations of um, the work that we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. There was also another interesting question um, asking about data privacy. You know, we have to always be aware of that. So how in your project is uh, this considered when you collect information, uh, especially with the GPS? So how do you mitigate any concerns related to data privacy? Yeah, so um, we... We don't collect like people's names and IDs. And uh, we also like have uh, uh, submitted an ethical uh, ethical form. So yeah, and uh, we don't um, publish results that uh, might include some like personal information such as like people's home locations or like, uh, yeah, or people's like destinations. Uh, we do um, process those informations, but uh, we would uh, only publish the uh, general results, the generalized results, such as uh, how, how many destinations in average like people take, or how many roads in average people use for their most common destination. Thank you, Ray. I think that answers very well the question. Um, I'm looking again at the chat and um, 
I think we pretty much address what is there. So I don't know if uh, if you have other questions. I may have one more, but uh, I want to let leave you room for other questions as a panel. Do you have any questions, Ray, for for the rest of the group? Um, yeah, I had uh, one question about uh, the following question, uh, the, the follow up question about like the previous conversation. I wondered if uh, I don't know if I missed it or not, but I wonder if people have access to uh, uh, to other people's uh, like scores or like evaluation, like in general, for example, how other people do in their like assessment in general. And if they, if that affects how they um, evaluate their own um, data in your app. The mobility app, the I can yeah. one app. Yeah. Yeah, people, they don't have access to other participants scores. So, yeah. Yeah, but I wonder if like, if, how, I wonder if that affects how, like, if they, for example, make a com kind of a competition about like, uh, and or an encouragement that like, would motivate them. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, that's something interesting <laughs> to consider, I guess. Um, so I see now. So we can maybe finish the session by looking at what we see uh, as uh, researchers in the field of mobility and transportation and aging. Are there any general messages or hopes or ways in which uh, uh, you think we should be going uh, for the next years in our field of research? Um, any uh, thoughts to share today? I saw that you want to make links with clinicians uh, with the driving uh, simulator. Um, Rehani, who wants to, uh, you know, get Canadian data so that we can see how this uh, applies here in Canada. And Maureen, uh, this is a, a new, totally new app that you want to put in the hands of uh, potential patients and uh, users. So I, I know you're really targeted towards concrete impacts. And um, so I see that I see everybody nodding, but I don't see a hand being raised. So I guess uh, this uh, can conclude our session unless you have other questions. Uh, Question, other ideas that come, but I have a few messages before we finish the session. Um, these are general messages for the EPIC conference uh, that is remaining. So um, tomorrow there is a session, an EPIC conference sessions on healthy uh, lifestyles and wellness. This is, uh, there will be three more presentations like today. So we invite you to come and attend this one at the same time. The APPTA, um, it's an Edgewell Innovation Hub, uh, will be hosting what they call pep talks. Oh, this is for tomorrow. So I'll just wait maybe for the next slide. Um, and then this is the slide about the pep talks. Um, so at the end of June, so actually uh, this will begin on June 22nd. This is an e-learning series for researchers to enhance their knowledge translation skills for policy audiences. So when we say we wanna have impact and practical impact, working on policies is often a very, quite a challenge for us researchers. So I think we can all learn from these sessions. So there is a QR code there, so you can scan it or visit the website and it was actually, it will be actually posted. Yeah, it's there, it's posted in the chat. So you can visit the website and uh, register for these sessions. And I guess uh, for Meg and Andrew, you could maybe explore how you can put this in the hands of the, of the ministry uh, through these sessions. Um, so we thank you very much for joining us today. And I want to say goodbye to everybody. And thank you so much for the presenters, for the great uh, material you shared with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you for coming. Bye -bye. So goodbye, everybody. Bye.